Music soothes the soul and music brings so much to joy to our life and well-being. The Hearing Loss Association of America Research Symposium on the joy of music and loving your ears is about still enjoying music while you have a hearing loss. Our symposiums bring science to the lay person on topics that they want to dig deeper into. So this isn't just about the joy of music, it's also about musicians and listening and audiences and protecting your hearing. Moving on to some cutting edge research, we know that certain aspects of music perception are challenging with hearing loss. Things like rhythm may be preserved, but other melodic components like pitch and timbre may be hard because of the technical limitations of cochlear implants and hearing aids. In one study from our lab, we looked at the impact of a tablet-based training program called Contours. Contours involved this tablet hooked up to a color-coded MIDI keyboard, and participants trained on playing melodic contours, basically pitch patterns of different shapes. Now, melodic contour is really important for music, but it's also really important for things like emotion perception, as well as understanding the intent of someone, say if someone is asking you a question or making a statement. 15 CI users were given these setups to take home and they trained for 10 hours over the course of four weeks. We tested them on meat, music, speech, and emotion perception. After training, we found that this led to better melodic contour identification for CI users, specifically on the piano uh, tones that were used by the contours program. But there were no improvements in speech perception or emotion perception, so we see some limited improvements in music perception with this training. With adults, there are these limited improvements, but children and pediatric populations seem to be a really different story. Children seem particularly malleable to training. In a review article by my colleague, Nicole Jim, musical training led to improvement in musical tasks, but also in speech perception and emotion perception. Children are very susceptible to changes as a result of musical training, and not just on auditory skills related to music. For example, one recent experiment looked at children with prelingual sensory neural hearing loss. Before the intervention, these children had poor outcomes for internalizing problems and lower scores on quality of life measures. Then they did a 12-week music therapy training program in person that was supplemented by online apps. When tested again, it was found that after training, these children had increased peer relationships and emotional regulations. So this is very significant because as I mentioned, these psychosocial improvements are very helpful for children with hearing loss. So we are seeing that training in children can lead to improvements in auditory areas and psychosocial areas. I now want to move on to another area of music research that's happening which involves the use of personalized pitch maps. This is work being done by my colleague Nicole Jim in our lab. Now, Dr. Lim and Dr. Jim are cochlear implant surgeons, and so this area of research is specifically for CI users. When you get your implant, post-surgery, an audiologist in the clinic will give you a standardized generic pitch map. And that's where we map the place on the electrodes of your implant and designate it for certain pitches or frequency. But the reality is that individuals have a lot of variability. This variability could be due to the size and shape of your cochlea, your hearing organ, and variability can even occur from how far the surgeon inserts the CI into your cochlea. A one-size-fits-all approach is used with pitch maps where each electro is programmed for specific frequencies. But the problem is that one size doesn't fit all. A generic pitch map can cause pitch distortion. And this pitch distortion can be significant to the point that things sound drastically different. Madonna's voice may sound like Minnie Mouse to one user. And for another one, it may sound like Darth Vader. So, our lab is researching personalized pitch maps and when the map is tailored to the individual. Using a new imaging technology called flat panel CT, we can image your cochlea and see exactly where the electrodes of a CI fall in your ear. Then, since we know where the electrodes are, we can create a personalized pitch map specifically for you and your CI. So for example, this picture shows various participants' cochleas and the white dots are the electrodes of their CIs. From these pictures, you can see a lot of variability in the shape of the CIs, the coils, etc., and why there might be a need for personalized pitch maps. In contrasting the personalized pitch maps and generic pitch maps, 
we've shown that there's a mismatch between pitch place mapping. The generic map can be sometimes off by 0.41 to 1.51 octave bands. In music, being off by one and a half octaves is a huge difference. In our cohort of participants for their study, we found that using personalized pitch maps, which were more accurate, led to improved pitch perception. It's possible that in the future, we may not always have to use standardized pitch maps, but instead tailor the programming of CIs better to the individual. In conclusion, there are a lot of unanswered questions within music and hearing research, but it's clear that more investigation is needed to create effective and tailored treatments, plans, and therapies. The Sound Health Network is a greater community of musicians and scientists and that want to work on these really exciting ideas and collaborate to find meaningful solutions to the problems. I started piano at age seven. And my mother, my, I should say my family, we were not very musical. My, my mother had studied piano as a child in Taiwan, and she was insistent that all three, all three of her girls learn to play the piano, no matter what. So I started piano at age seven. Two years later, uh, my hearing loss was discovered at a school screening. The hearing loss was determined to be uh, profound on the right side and mild to moderate on the left. So because they thought, well, it's profound on the right side and they wouldn't any sense in aiding the right ear. And so I got a hearing aid only in the left ear and I was a, I've been a long time hearing aid user. I, at the age of 16, I decided I'm very tired of piano. It's mom's instrument, it's not my instrument. I was gonna choose something else and I just fell in love with the sound of orchestral strings. Um, Although I did face a lot of attitudinal barriers about how someone with such a significant hearing loss like me could learn a string instrument. In any case, I finally took a violin in college and uh, I studied violin for two and a half years in college. And then, but I loved it so much. So, so, well, so right after college, I went to Gallaudet University for uh, a semester of study. And because I miss, I love my instruments so much, I would practice on the, on the up floor of the library. And only the hearing student at the university said, why is there a violinist playing on the third floor of the Gallaudet Library? But anyway, so, um, I, love, so I, love my, my, I love playing violin so much. I, right after uh, graduate school, I went back to private lessons and I was taking lessons, you know, uh, up until 1996. Spring of 1996, I lost the remainder of my hearing. And we don't know what happened. We just know that I had a, uh, that I had a viral infection. And um, so I lost the remainder of my hearing. Seven months later, I received my first cochlear implant at Johns Hopkins. This is way back, what, in 1997, so I'm really an old timer here. And, um, but and I was told, you know, those of you who have cochlear implant, you might, you might have audiologists who try to lower your expectations about what you can do with music with the implant. And then, and so about a year after that, I realized, okay, I can play violin all right on the implant, but I want to advance further. I didn't, want, I didn't just want to play elementary piece. I want to be able to play on the higher of, of the keyboard, of the fingerboard of the violin. But I also knew that the sound quality was going to be so bad if I play anything above third position uh, on the highest string. So I said, well, well, we know that cochlear implants are supposed to be for 250 hertz to 2000 hertz. If you are playing, you know, anything two octaves above middle C, you're not going to hear the, uh, the sound quality really well. So I said, well, I do want to advance better as a musician. I really don't care about the instrument so much, and I decided to switch to viola. Um, so I've been learning viola ever since, and um, I also participated in adult musical ensembles for uh, adult students like me. Um, I live in the Washington, D.C. area where there's a lot of opportunities for adult music students um, and I currently take orchestra class at uh, the Levine School of Music which is um, a very well-known community music school in the DC area. 
And, well, but then my musical adventure didn't finish until, because I, I also started ringing handbells uh, in 2015 when the, the Catholic church I was attending started a handbell group. And so I liked it so much that when the music director left, I said, I still want handbells in my life. And I thought, well, and I'm not going to another church. I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to see if I could bring handbells to my federal agency. So I, there, was, there was no musical outlet in, there, in, in my life for handbells, but I created one. So I just want you to all to know that when you're an amateur musician, even if your, per, your daily job is in music, your, you can make, you could make your outside of work activity very musical. So, and, and in 2001, after I've had several years with my cochlear implant, I thought, we really need to talk with audiologists about why music needs to have an equal amount of attention as speech perception. You can go to any scientific uh, indexer and find thousands of articles about speech perception with relation to hearing devices. But you will only find only a small percentage will cover music, percep music perception with hearing devices. So, um, and I was hearing stories about people who didn't know how to explain to their audiologists why music was sounding so bad with their hearing aids or even with their cochlear implant. And I had to tell them because most audiologists don't understand musical terminology, you have to use something called a music frequency note chart to explain. By the way, if anybody wants to know why I, cut, I talk about adult musicians, it's mostly because um, I learn music more as an adult than as a child, and I think there's not enough opportunities. A lot of musical, a music education majors, they spend their time focusing on children. They don't really know, they don't spend a lot of time focusing on how to teach adult music. And I want to say, just because you turn 18 does not mean your musical life or your time of playing in the band or the orchestra is over. You just have to find a way to keep it in your life. And why is something like this so important for people to listen to? So, you know, if you grew up with normal hearing, and then you grew up very musical, and then you lost your hearing later in life, it just doesn't sound the same or you have to retrain your brain. It's like learning a new language. And so, you know, music is very emotional. You know, they have, we have something, what do they call it? Uh, musical memory or um, it's called musical nostalgia. And it's talking about the fact that the music that you listened to when you were a teenager is like gonna be your favorite music of all time. So for me, like growing up, I was a teenager in like the 80s. That's my music, you know, classic rock, you know, musical theater has always been a part of my life. And so, you know, when you're not able to enjoy music in the same way, there's some adjustments that need to happen. And so the way that I just kind of pivoted with that was to enjoy it in different ways.